What does sustainability mean? It means creating a world where we can all meet our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. In other words, enough for everyone, forever. So what is our current situation? Natural resources are being used up, farmland is being lost, clean water is becoming scarce, waste is accumulating in the air, on land and in the water, one billion people are hungry every day, a child dies as a result of poor sanitation every 20 seconds, and species extinction rates are hundreds of times higher than normal. Yet as we know, the key to intelligent tinkering is keeping all the parts. And all this before we are dealing with potential challenges from climate change. In order to be sustainable, we have to understand the whole system we are working within. Here's an example of how things can go wrong if we don't. Some volunteers from an NGO visited a village in Borneo and saw many people suffering from malaria. So they arranged for the area to receive an aerial spray of DDT to kill the malaria carrying mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were virtually wiped out and the problem solved, or so they thought. As it happened, most of the cockroaches in the village were affected by the DDT too, but it wasn't enough to kill them. Instead, they were eaten by the local lizards, which became slow and lazy from the accumulated poison, making them easy prey for the village cats. The cats all died from the toxic buildup from eating so many poison lizards, and when they were gone, rats and mice began invading the village, bringing new diseases with them. To make matters worse, without the lizards to eat them, other insects began destroying the palm leaf roofs of the village huts, leaving the villagers now exposed to the elements. And finally, the few mosquitoes that had survived the spraying rapidly repopulated the village, spreading malaria as they had always done. So now the villagers not only had malaria, they also had new diseases and a lack of shelter. So you can see how necessary it is to consider the whole system. What is the whole system we are working within? It's our planet Earth. The biosphere is the layer around our planet where all life exists, and it's as thin and fragile as the skin of an onion. Inside the biosphere, nature works in elegant, closed-loop cycles where all matter is recycled. Energy comes in and out of our system, but matter never leaves it. Sustainability is about our own human society being able to continue indefinitely within these natural cycles. Within minutes of us breathing out, our breath has mixed with the surrounding air to be eventually blown all over the planet. Every breath we take today contains atoms that were once whispered in the prayers of Mother Teresa, laughed out of the Buddha, and even snorted out of dinosaurs. Everything is connected. Our bodies contain many elements, but as carbon is the news these days, let's have a look at that one. Carbon is one of the building blocks of life. It's in all plants and all animals, including us. About 15 kilograms of our body mass is carbon. But where did it come from? It was created in the stars. In fact, it takes three star lifetimes to make carbon. And that is almost all of time since the beginning of the universe. But here we are now, walking around, each packed with stardust. Some of the carbon that was originally part of living organisms millions of years ago now forms part of the Earth's crust in the form of coal, oil, limestone, chalk, marble and sparkling diamonds. Life is very much connected with the planet itself. So what happens to carbon in the biosphere? It starts off in the atmosphere. Plants have evolved to use the sun's energy to remove carbon dioxide from the air and break it apart. They use the carbon with water and other elements to grow their structure or store energy as fuel and they release the oxygen back into the atmosphere as a byproduct. This is the process of photosynthesis. Before there were plants, there was almost no oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. But by pumping oxygen into the air over millions of years, plants have made it possible for oxygen-breathing animals like us to evolve. Plants also turn the sun's energy into a form we can eat. The solar energy captured during photosynthesis and stored as fuel is what keeps every animal on the planet alive, including us. To obtain the energy we need to survive and function, we either eat plants directly, 
or eat other animals that have eaten plants themselves. Plants are also rainmakers. They absorb water through their roots and release it as water vapour. And half our medications are made from or derived directly from plants. So plants produce the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and the medications that maintain our health. We owe them our very existence. All the carbon in all the trees in all the forests was once in the atmosphere. Now half of the forests that existed before humans started farming have been destroyed, releasing all that carbon back into the atmosphere. We have also been releasing carbon from organisms that lived millions of years ago by burning the oil and coal that they had become. So the level of carbon in the atmosphere is becoming dangerously high. But that's another story. So what's already making our existence on the planet unsustainable? It's mostly a case of supply and demand. While our population and demand for resources is increasing, the Earth's resources and its ability to process our waste is decreasing. The closer we come to the meeting point of these two pressures, the more difficult it will be to sustain ourselves and any future generations. Our rising population alone is creating an unsustainable demand on natural resources. In the time since someone now in their 50s was born, the world's population has more than doubled. Each new person needs food, water, shelter and energy. As the world's economies develop, we demand more and more resources from the planet. This demand on the Earth's biosphere can be measured as an ecological footprint. It represents the area of productive land and the sea needed to supply all the resources we are consuming. By 2007, people were using natural resources one and a half times the rate at which they could be naturally regenerated. So our ecological footprint equaled one and a half planet Earths. Without realising it, we had gone into overdraft. If we continue like this, by the middle of 2030, we will be using twice as much resources as our planet can provide. That is obviously not sustainable in the long term, so something will have to change. Let's begin with just one problem of our unsustainable development, the oceans. Here's marine ecologist Professor Jeremy Jackson. Industrial fishing uses big stuff, big machinery. We use nets that are 20 miles long. We use long lines that have 1 million or 2 million hooks. And we trawl, which means to take something the size of a tractor trailer truck that weighs thousands and thousands of pounds, put it on a big chain, and drag it across the seafloor to stir up the bottom and catch the fish. And, and think of it as being kind of the bulldozing of a city or of a forest because it, it, it clears it away. And the habitat destruction is unbelievable. This is a photograph, a typical photograph, of what the continental shelves of the world look like. You can see the rows in the bottom, the way you can see the rows in a field that has just been plowed to plant corn. What that was, was a forest of sponges and coral, which is a critical habitat for the development of fish. What it is now is mud. And um, the area of the ocean floor that has been transformed from forest to level mud to parking lots is equivalent to the entire area of all the forests that have ever been cut down on all of the earth in the history of humanity. And we've managed to do that in the last 100 to 150 years. So the question is, how are we all going to respond to this? And, and we can do all sorts of things to fix it. But in the final analysis, the really th thing we really need to fix is ourselves. It's not about the fish. It's not about the pollution. It's not about the climate change. It's about us and our greed and our need for growth and our inability to imagine a world which is different from the selfish world we live in today. So the question is, will we respond to this or not? I would say that the future of life and the dignity of human beings depends on our doing that. Thank you. 
Much of the plastic we use in our daily lives gets washed down stormwater drains or blown by the wind and eventually ends up in the ocean. So now we're getting into the problem of waste. Plastic bags, cigarette lighters, toothbrushes, golf balls, printer cartridges. About three and a half million pieces of plastic are dumped in the ocean every day and the UN estimates that every square kilometre of ocean now contains more than 18,000 pieces of floating plastic. The prevailing currents and eddies move it about until large amounts accumulate in five huge ocean garbage patches around the planet. One of these is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Recent research suggests that it's larger than the whole of Australia. This is a huge problem for birds and fish, as they can't distinguish the small degrading pieces of plastic from their usual food sources. So they eat them until their stomachs are filled with plastic, and then they die. One mutton bird on Lord Howe Island was found to have 15% of its body mass being plastic. That's like us walking around with over 10 kilograms of plastic in our stomach. Plastic contains many chemicals from its own manufacture, but it also acts like a sponge in the ocean, soaking up toxic elements. It can become hundreds of times more toxic than the surrounding sea. But it's not only a problem for marine life. As everything is connected, the effects of all that plastic come back to haunt us as well. Those same toxins enter our own food chain and accumulate inside us. Many of them accumulate in animal fat, biomagnifying food chains, and everything being connected turn up in human breast milk or contaminate our children even before they are born. What about the water that flows into the oceans? Well, that's not doing well either. Every day, about 2 million tonnes of human waste flows directly into the water supplies. And biodiversity? It's estimated that 27,000 species go extinct every year. Did you know that Australia has the worst mammal extinction rate in the world? What happened to keeping all the parts? Those increasing demands for, and decreasing supplies of, the Earth's resources, can be viewed as creating a funnel, with ever-diminishing room to manoeuvre. The walls are closing in on everyone. But before they close altogether, we have a chance to stabilise them and discern a clear path through to the future. The longer we delay taking action, the less room we will have to move, and the more pressure there will be on the remaining resources creating a recipe for conflict. Communities and businesses that ignore the problem face big risks, increasing costs for resources and waste management, growing social unrest, and increasing public demand for a more sustainable approach. But those organisations that move strategically towards sustainability are likely to reduce their risks, reap rewards, and find a safe path through to the future. So, how can we find a sustainable path? As Einstein said, a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive. An international network of scientists have developed four conditions based on scientific laws that would enable our continuing existence to be sustainable within the system of planet Earth. Those conditions became the foundation of an international program called the Natural Step, and since then, thousands of leaders, corporations, governments and communities have used those sustainability conditions to develop their own strategic path towards sustainable development. And they are reaping some unexpected rewards. Reduced energy costs, reduced risk, new revenue opportunities, increased employee retention and productivity, enhanced customer loyalty, reduced waste management costs, increased marketing advantages, improved stakeholder relations and policies that keep ahead of new environmental laws and taxes. Let's look at those four system conditions for sustainability. Here is a summary of what they mean. The first one means we should mine only what can be used without polluting nature. That doesn't mean we need to stop mining, we can't build wind turbines without steel, but we need to be smarter with what we mine and how we manage mine materials especially the toxic ones. This sustainability condition prompts questions like can we use renewable energy instead of fossil fuel? And can we more efficiently reuse and recycle materials? 
The second sustainability condition means we should produce substances only at the rate that nature can process them. That includes reducing the production of plastics, pesticides, fire retardants and carbon dioxide. Following this sustainability condition we might ask, can we substitute a synthetic compound with a more natural one? And can we recycle this substance in a closed loop cycle? The third sustainability condition urges us to protect natural systems from being physically degraded. That doesn't mean we have to stop harvesting natural resources, we need them to survive. But we should take them only from sustainably managed ecosystems and use them efficiently. Otherwise there will just be fewer and fewer left in years to come. Those first three sustainability conditions involve using the planet's resources more wisely. If they are met, the planet can keep providing us with the natural resources and protection we need to survive and to thrive. The last sustainability condition involves our social responsibility to create a society where everyone can meet their basic needs. Following this sustainability condition we might ask, can we buy a fair trade product whose producers are paid a fair price? And do the makers of this product have a safe and healthy work environment? The vision of a sustainable version of our own organisation or community built upon the four sustainability conditions can act like a lighthouse guiding our actions towards making that vision a reality, step by step. It enables us to build a plan that will get us there. As we make decisions along the way, we can revisit the four conditions and our plan to check we are still on the right path. The Nike Corporation, after attracting much criticism about how its products were made, trained a hundred employees in the four sustainability conditions and developed a sustainability vision they call North Star. Nike director Jim Goddard referred to it as a far off guiding light that lets us make sure we can stay on track. According to the multinational company Unilever, two billion times a day someone uses one of its products. So when, in 2010, it set the aim to double the size of its business whilst halving its environmental impact by 2020, it created a milestone along the road to sustainable development. Unilever's global CEO Paul Polman says, we do not believe there is a conflict between sustainability and profitable growth. In Australia, the RED project consists of a closed loop system in which school children collect the type of plastic that is not accepted through council curbside collections, like soft plastic shopping bags and food packaging. That waste is then recycled to make playground equipment that the schools can use. As Buckminster Fuller once said, Pollution is nothing but the resources we are not harvesting. We have looked at just a few of the threats to our survival on Earth and only briefly outlined the four sustainability conditions that can guide us all to a more sustainable future. And we've also only scratched the surface of all the inspiring solutions people are coming up with. There are many more all around us. Are you part of them?